You are listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. All right, and welcome to the Vonu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you again from the homestead here in southern Illinois uh, with another uh, intermission episode uh, today. So yeah, you'll hear another LUA Radio Classic, uh, this time the first installment of our direct action series recorded on uh, January 3rd, 2016. The topics of discussion are committees of safety and security teams, and my guest was Gary Hunt from the Outpost of Freedom blog. Over the past couple of weeks, I've released two related episodes. Number one was a repost of an old Bill Cooper podcast on militias, and the other was the spoken discourse of Kyle Reardon and I's article on the origins of the Harney County Committee of Safety. Well, with the increased importance of organizing locally, you know, with recent events and all, uh, as well as the mostly manufactured chaos ensuing in the servile society, uh, I figured I would enlighten you with a more thorough conversation uh, in hopes of inspiring some action. Uh, because honestly, guys, I'm an anarchist for Newen, but I would set up a committee of safety tomorrow. And uh, we do talk about uh, one of my questions is, uh, so Gary, can an anarchist be in a committee of safety? Can they start one? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. But uh, you'll hear a lot more about that uh, in just uh, just a few moments. Uh, this also just happens to be the episode where my words were transcribed into an FBI investigatory document. Again, not Vonu, not Vonu at all, but it's not like it was really in my control. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes if you're interested in checking that out. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that, of course, Gary is a constitutionalist, and this discussion centers around direct action within that ideology. And if you've been following the patriot constitutionalist movement for long, or you heard the spoken discourse of Kyle's article um, on uh, doom porn, uh, you'll know that uh, the anti-Muslim rhetoric was uh, rather strong uh, around this time. If I could overlook the couple of related comments here, and I'm sure you can too, but I just figured I'd give that bit of a warning. Uh, we don't uh, fall prey to doom porn here on the Vanu podcast, or at least we try not to. And I certainly could give a shit less uh, what religious or spiritual affiliation, uh, you know, a venuance subscribes to, uh, so long as they uh, believe in non-aggression and self-defense. Lastly, please check out our sponsor, Liberty Under Attack Publications, for your anarchist venuan book needs, or if you're looking for a publisher. Uh, the website is libertyunderattack.com. This past week, we released a brand new book, A Vanu Guide to Firearms, by the pseudonymous Josiah Warren. This magazine-style, full-color guide includes an introduction to Vanu, the transcript of my Gun Printing 101 episode with Ivan the Troll, along with most everything you need to know when it comes to the topics of Vanu and firearms. To pick that up, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Gun Guide. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Gun Guide, or just head to the main site to see all of the books and privacy tools we offer, in addition to uh, some pretty exclusive bundles. Uh, you can save, uh, save a lot of money. Uh, we try to get uh, these books out to you as, uh, close to we can, as, as close as we can to cost. So I think that's all for today. Uh, please enjoy, and always remember, Vanu is yours for the making. So tonight, for the first installment of the Direct Action Series, we'll be joined by Gary Hunt to discuss committees of safety and security teams. Gary Hunt was a professional land surveyor, uh, having been the county surveyor for Orange County, Florida from 1974 to 1978. He began private practice in 1978 and continued as such until 1993, when events in Waco, Texas, caused him to leave his business in pursuit of restoring the Constitution. In 1989, he began researching, investigating, and studying history, law, and events where the government was pointing its guns in the wrong direction. He began publishing a patriot newspaper, Outpost of Freedom, in February of 1993, when your humble host uh, was a mere nine months old. Uh, since that time, he has, investigated, uh, he has investigated numerous occurrences, including Waco, the murder of Michael Hill, Ohio militia chaplain, Oklahoma City bombing, and other events. He has attended the sites to investigate the events and has reported on his investigations. He has continued to report his findings on the internet as well as write articles about other current events, about the history of the revolutionary era, and the founding documents. His website can be found at outpost-of-freedom.com forward slash blog, and we definitely recommend uh, you go check out his work. Uh, so Gary, without further ado, welcome back to Liberty Under Attack Radio, sir. Uh, how are you doing this evening? Just fine. I didn't realize that was I. I was that much older than you. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just a couple of years. Just a couple of but years. I'm I'm doing fine and uh, good to be back on your show. 
All right, we're definitely uh, definitely happy to have you. Um, so the first time we had you on uh, um, back in September, we covered the creation of political uh, political prisoners. Um, uh, you have been working on uh, a new case um, regarding uh, a gentleman, and for those who may uh, uh, may not know uh, about Skylar Barbeau, uh, why don't you just real quick in a minute or two um, kind of uh, inform uh, the listeners on what you've been uh, kind of uh, working on in this case and uh, what what is kind of situ- what his situation is. Well, Skylar Barbeau, uh, <laughs> interestingly, based upon an affidavit that was filed for a search warrant, uh, they were trying to demonize Skylar Barbeau. The results of that affidavit bore no fruit after the search warrant was served. But uh, he had a rifle barrel that, or a, a barrel that was legally purchased. In fact, he had two barrels legally purchased. One was 10 and a half inches and the other one was uh, 16 or 18 inches. And he had a receiver, and he had some night vision things uh, uh, and other optical equipment. And he wanted to sell them because he wanted to go from uh, five five six to seven six two caliber or uh, millimeter uh, bullet size that would be two two three to uh, three oh six and mm-hmm. uh, caliber. And uh, so he put these in a case together and. This, what was considered by some to be his best friend was going to sell them for him so he could get the money to, to change calibers. Um, it was delivered to the friend, and this is kind of interesting. We all uh, hear things about uh, uh, a chain of evidence, how they control evidence, how it's kept track of. But he gave it to the, the informant who then turned it over to the FBI, and then we don't know how many hands it went through between be, be, before it got to this lady FBI expert that said, yes, this is a rifle and it has a short barrel. It's an SBR short barrel rifle, and he did not pay the tax and he did not register it. So basically he was stuck with driving without a license uh, for a $200 tax and registration. But instead he's facing five years in prison. Now the the, <laughs> the informant was paid $3,500. That's not counting the 25 goons and I don't know how many other suited guys uh, that did the, the, the search warrant raid, uh, probably 10 grand in, involved in that raid. And mm-hmm. this is all to collect a $200 tax and get him to register. So is it a tax issue or is that just the uh, constitutional nexus that they misapply to actually control, infringe upon the Second Amendment? But it's a rather interesting case, and and Shane's done an excellent job. I write blogs, and they scroll down the page. Shane is uh, on uh, Liberty Under Attack as uh, the political prisoner page. Uh, You can see all of the articles, all the documents uh, that support the the articles, uh, everything that's important there. Uh, He's done a better job than I have in getting the information out. I just write it. (laughs) So I'm I'm very pleased with uh, his work in that regard. But it's a rather interesting story. And as with uh, Robert Beecher in Georgia, Kevin Massey, uh, Casey Massey in Texas, and William Wolf in Montana, and now uh, uh, Skylar Barbeau in Washington, we begin to get a picture of how the government is turning their direction on terrorists to American patriots who believe in the Constitution rather than uh, Farouk and uh, Malik, who uh, were on the watch list but managed to kill, what was it, 14 people and injure 22 people in San Bernardino, California. Mm-hmm. So the government is, seems to be focusing on people that believe in the Constitution. The Constitution created this country. The government exists as a consequence of the Constitution, and they're turning against the people that support that Constitution, and they're ignoring the people that are crossing the ocean with malice in mind. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. But uh, I think it helps to understand uh, the the persecution of patriots uh, on Shane's page there. Okay. Yep. And that is, uh, if you just go to libertyunderattack.com, you'll see a political prisoners tab and Skylar Barbeau is the top one when it drops down. And I definitely recommend you uh, at least go read Gary's articles. They're uh, very enlightening. And it really just shows you, uh, <laughs> shows you uh, the, uh, I, I guess, uh, the, the, 
tyranny of the of, of the government. So uh, definitely recommend you go check that out. And as he said, the, all of his articles are linked there as well. Um, so it's a one stop shop. Um, so let's uh, move forward to uh, um, to the first topic: uh, committees of safety. Uh, but before we do that, I, I think I'll begin each edition of this direct action series by explaining why these specific subject or subjects are on the freedom umbrella of direct action. Uh, for both committees of safety and security teams, there is no subjugation before those who claim to be our rulers, and they both allow people to take the initiative themselves in either restoring liberty or by providing individual or collective self-defense. For the benefit of the listening audience, I do think it is important to note that committees of safety are from within the constitutionalist ideology, so this may not be applicable for some, uh, but nonetheless, it is a form of direct action, even if uh, their goal is limited government. Our job in the direct action series is not to tell you which forms of direct action you should take. Our job is only to provide you with the information necessary to make that decision for yourself. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to read a uh, short document written by John Hancock uh, regarding the formation of committees of safety back on April 12th, 1775. Mr. Producer, if you could toss up the only image in Dropbox uh, up on the live stream, uh, I would definitely appreciate it. All right, and this was, uh, like I said, uh, April 12, 1775, quote, Whereas the preservation of our county from slavery depends under God on an effectual ex execution of the continental and provincial measures for that purpose. Resolved that there be now appointed for each county in this colony a committee consisting of five persons, any three of whom to be a quorum, whose business that shall be to receive from the committees of correspondence in their respective counties. A state of the... Conduct of the towns and districts with respect to their having executed the continental and provincial plans as foresaid, and it shall be the duty of said committees to meet on the first Wednesdays of May, July, September, November, January, and March, and prepare a report of these same to be laid before the Congress at its, next, at its then next session that any neglect of such towns and districts and executing such plans may be speedily and effectually remedied. Also resolved that it be, and it is hereby strongly recommended to the committees of correspondence in the several towns and districts in this colony, sometime before the first Wednesday in May, July, September, November, January, and March, aforesaid, to render to any of the members of their county committees, aforesaid, a true state of the conduct of their respective towns and districts with respect to their having executed each plan recommended by the Continental and Provincial Congresses, and to use their utmost diligence for this important purpose. And whereas some towns and districts in the colony may be destitute of so excellent an institution as committees of correspondence, resolved that it be, and it hereby is strongly recommended to such towns and districts, forthwith to choose them, and to afford them assistance at all times in effectually suppressing the efforts of the enemies of America whenever they shall make them. Signed by order of the Provincial Congress, John Hancock, President, end quote. Uh, so, Gary, let's uh, obviously the, we'll start out with this, this basic question. Uh, what is a committee of safety? Well, you just uh, read uh, the the signature and title, uh, President of the Provincial Congress, which was later known as the Massachusetts Committee of Safety. There was a uh, an effort over time, and, and virtually all the states adopted uh, the 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 colonial provincial committees of safety uh, concept. I shouldn't say states; they didn't exist in that form at the time, but. Uh, Committees of safety go back, as far as I've traced them, go back to the time of uh, uh, the the English Revolution, in, I think it was 1655, uh, where the uh, Royalists, uh, well, the Round Hats and the uh, Royalists uh, were at odds with each other. There was a challenge to the royal government, and the committees of safety were formed to provide legitimacy to the militias that were created to take on the royal forces. Um, we find them early in our history. There was a, a governor of New England. This is before the uh, solidification of uh, the identities of, of the respective colonies. Uh, the governor of uh, New England was a guy named Andros, and he was raising quit rents and doing all kinds of things that people didn't like. So the militias, which were formed at the time to protect against the Indians, were subordinate to civil authority. So they created committees of safety. Those committees of safety then directed them to uh, arrest Andros and imprison him. And he stayed in jail until he was returned to England. Now, he did come back years later under royal authority. But I think he was a little nicer guy when he came back again because of what he'd suffered the first round. Um, now, then we get to uh, 
more recent history, prior to the revolution, uh, where I've found reference to committees of safety would be the Susquehanna River Valley in Pennsylvania and the Mohawk Valley in, in western New York, uh, where they were on the fringes of society and they had uh, uh, Indian in, in incursions. Uh, Indians were a threat. And um, the uh, Susquehanna Valley, for example, in tracing my own gene genealogy, I find reference to the committees of safety ordering the creation of uh, forts. Hmm. Uh, one of my ancestors uh, and, and his uh, fiance happened to be visiting a fort before their scheduled uh, wedding. Uh, they were supposed to have it at a different town and the Indians came in. So they went ahead with the wedding, but all the wedding guests happened to be at the other location. But these forts were set up and the defensive uh, against Indians were set up under the authority of the Committee of Safety, who were the civil authority that the militia subordinated to. Then we move into the Revolutionary Era. And there's an excellent book called The Minutemen by John Galvin, recently published, uh, I think, in the last couple of years, uh, where he goes into detail of the role of the Committees of Safety uh, during the events at Lexington and, and Concord in April of 1775, um, where the one of the militias had uh, from a different county had to get permission from the Committee of Safety before they could leave the county, and it took them six hours. So they were kind of late getting to the battle. The British hmm. were already back in uh, almost to Charleston by the time they got to leave the county and go play. But uh, the, the, he, he's got some very good references to the Committee of Safety and their role in giving consent or directing their militias to go aid those primarily at Concord because Lexington had already occurred and then the Battle Road march back. Uh, what uh, uh, Shane just read you about the uh, what, exactly one week before then, April 12th, uh, week uh, 1775, uh, Hancock and the Provincial Congress were encouraging the creation of committees of safety. Uh, I think it was South Carolina and uh, Massachusetts really had more activity, more resentment towards the Crown, so they had been creating committees of safety for quite some time. Some continued to ca carry the name of Committee of so Correspondence, which uh, goes back to the uh, uh, the uh, initial taxes back in 1765 okay. uh, and but they acted as a committee of safety they became an executive branch of government um, the various names committee of correspondence safety or protection they serve different purposes most adopted the committee of safety name somewhere along the line some retained their old name uh, for example the provincial congress uh, became the massachusetts committee of safety so the role they played in our our uh, our our history in the creation of the United States is is phenomenal. For example, the first and second Continental Congresses were both called by committees of safety, and they, then they sent their delegates. Uh, most of the states had them. Some by by then, New York was the one that really encouraged the first um, committee uh, uh, of uh, Continental Congress get together. And so we find them in our history. Now, what were they? They were actually a parallel government. And we can go back to 1774 in Western Massachusetts, where Worcester, Massachusetts established basically, a, they called it an association, but a committee of safety when they declared independence from British rule, unless they returned to the original Massachusetts charter. That was based on the uh, the uh, uh, Massachusetts Government Act, which came out a week after the Massachusetts Bay Act, uh, which is where they embargoed Boston. Uh, they uh, closed the courts, reopened the courts to deal only with criminal matters, no civil matters. They dismissed the militia and enrolled only non-Tories back into the militia and created a parallel government to fill in where the government failed. Let's go back to... Uh, Mohawk Valley, because it's a good demonstration. The government in Albany was not big enough or strong enough to provide a military force to protect the people from the Indians. Uh, so where the government could not 
fill in the gap uh, in their responsibilities, the Committee of Safety became kind of a parallel government to fill those gaps that the other government, the larger government, could not. Uh, which is exactly what happened in Orchester. They said the, the the royal government is not, so we're going to fill in the whole whole gap, which they did in their uh, case. A number of others occurred prior uh, to the uh, April 19, 1775, but we begin to see the picture of uh, the role of committees of safety. Now, if we extend that through the entire Revolutionary War era, with the exception of the uh, back and forth that occurred primarily in New Jersey and in the South, where one side, uh, uh, the the royal uh, the uh, royal government would, forces would push the patriots back, and the patriots would push them back. It was going back and forth. With the exception of those areas, generally you had committees of safety continuing civil government throughout. So we didn't run into the uh, the circumstances that uh, the French Revolution, the Revo Russian Revolution, or any other revolution um, had. We had a, a civil government in place throughout the entire country, uh, or the colonies mm. at the time. So the transition from the royal government to the government under the Articles of Confederation and subsequently into, under the Constitution was continually in existence and exerting its authority where necessary and relinquishing that uh, authority uh, to, uh, let's call it a higher power uh, during the course of transition. So our revolutionary war, our revolution was unique in the world at that time because there was a never a loss of government in most parts of the country. Okay, okay. Very interesting. And just one quick question, um, um, and you kind of you, you might have already explained it. So the the relation between committees of safety at that time and uh, the the higher power, as you put it, um, the, the the higher power realized that they couldn't provide some of those functions, so they had a, they had a good working relationship uh, during that time. Right, and then well, that was uh, pre April nineteenth. After April nineteenth, uh, the committees of safety actually created their own higher power. The Government was actually built from the bottom up rather than what we see when we look out the window today from the top down. You know, the president's the most powerful man in the world. No, he's the bottom of the stack. He works for all of us. We're the employers. We employ him. He's the bottom of the stack rather than the top of the stack. And, uh, and their concept of bottom-up government was very strong then because they made the rules. And the the coalition that was created by the Articles of Confe uh, Confederation was subject to the approval of the committees of safety from the local level to the state level and then to the Continental Congress. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so obviously, back in um, back in the in the revolutionary times, uh, committees of safety were completely above ground. They were working with a higher power. Um, so. Um, Committee of safeties aren't uh, – they wouldn't be done in secret today, right? They would be completely above grounds, uh, open, transparent, things of that nature? Yeah, since they're not anti-government, uh, why should they hide? Uh, the First Amendment, the right to peacefully assemble, the right to freedom of speech, uh, that's what a committee of safety is. Why the First Amendment? It addresses – and the, uh, the, the freedom of the press because the committees of correspondence were transmitting news back and forth. So uh, the elements of the First Amendment are 100% uh, supportive of the concept of uh, committees of safety, probably for a good reason, too. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, so um, now I will admit, uh, before the Committee of Safety meeting held uh, on January 29, 20, uh, 2015, that was actually simulcasted here on FPRN. Uh, I have never, I'd never heard of them before. Um, and that was uh, the meeting uh, – you mentioned William Wolfe as a political prisoner. That was the meeting that he spoke at, if I remember correctly. Uh, is, yes. is, there, is there just minimal information about committees of safety, or are they just conven conven conveniently left out by the government schools as a lot of other information is? Well, a lot of people suggest that they sh they, uh, the government has conspired to leave them out. But, you know, as I study history, I find something interesting. About 1815 to 1825 – People were looking back at uh, the war that had occurred in the new government and everything, and they just went on. That when the war was over, they wanted to get on with life. They wanted to establish their state governments. Uh, they wanted to get, uh, you know, industry, everything going right again. 
so they kind of let things slide. So somewhere around 1815, we start getting people saying, well, you know, these people that were that, that fought the, you know, Washington was dead by then. These people that fought the revolution and created this government, they're dying off. We need to start recording history. So they started recording history. But even then, they're looking for events and heroes, events and heroes. And so the, the concept of, uh, you know, these uh, events and heroes became the foundation of the history, the, the key points. Very few wrote on the the more in-depth history in public. However, you can find it in their private writings. You can find a lot of it between Jefferson and John Adams, for example. Uh, but history picked up this event and heroes uh, okay. concept okay. and it's carried through. Now, I don't want to discount the other side though, because Johnny Tremaine was a movie, Dis, a Disney movie put out back in the 70s, I think, maybe the 60s, long time ago. And it was kind of interesting because the version that is available now is a little bit shorter than the old one, but I remember watching that years ago and they were talking about committees of safety uh, huh. a number of times. Now, it, they still mention committees of safety, but only where it's necessary for the plot to survive rather than the in, more informative. And it's only two or three minutes they've cut out. Uh, and that was after Walt Disney died. It was under the uh, control of Michael Eisner at that time when they cut, uh, republished it and took the pieces out. So it appears that there is a concerted effort to attack committees of safety. And, uh, you know, Wolf is a, a good example in the indictment or in the uh, criminal complaint on William Wolf. They talk about him talking and what he said at the committees of safety. Now, the interesting thing is before the committees of safety, uh, William Wolfe was an advocate of violence. And when he started, when he, he and I did a number of radio shows on the committees of safety, and he started to see that there's a potential for a peaceful solution to the problem. So he was shifting gears and dropping these aspects of violence, but mm. it bothered the government so much that they made it instrumental in demonization of William Wolf. He was associated with committees of safety. Well, damn, our whole government's associated with committees of safety. <laughs> uh, so they're using it. And I had a conversation with uh, Casey Massey earlier today, and uh, they've filed a sealed document trying to uh, extend his uh, sentencing by another 13 months or increase his sentencing by uh, recommendation by 13 months. Well, they filed wow. it late. They're supposed to file it 10 or 14 days prior. They filed it on the 30th. His sentencing is on the the four so he's going to ask for it to be stricken if his attorney doesn't uh, tomorrow when he goes for sentencing. But in that, what his attorney did show him was reference to, to Gary Hunt and committees of safety. <laughs> of so course, of course. <laughs> the government doesn't like committees of safety. They are a consequence of committees of safety and they want to damn them. As I said before, they're going after American terrorists, not Islamic terrorists. All okay. <laughs> Muslims are good. All patriots are bad. Okay, you know we are we are coming up to this uh, to this first break here, and when we come back, we'll we'll wrap up a little more that just a little more of the history, and then we'll get into the uh, the actual direct action of uh, forming a committee of safety. Uh, so stay tuned, and feel free to give us a call if uh, you have any questions for uh, Gary Hunt. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. But yeah, let's get back to uh, um, back to our discussion on committees of safety with Gary Hunt. His blog is uh, located at the out, at outpost a dash of dash freedom dot com forward slash blog um so uh you kind of already mentioned uh the um committees of safety's role in, in the founding of this country but uh, uh i was curious uh, i was looking through some of the uh, bylaws and requirements for joining some of the already existing committees of safety and uh, i distinctly remember one of them requiring that all members uh, uh adhere to the constitution uh now is is that a requirement or like uh, for example could me as an anarchist start or join a committee of safety well, uh, the, the, there was no constitution back in 1775 uh, to adhere to, and they abandoned the British government because they were not afforded the rights of Englishmen under the British constitution. There was a constitution. The British constitution is a compilation of perhaps hundreds of documents that over the years had set out rights, beginning with the Magna Carta. Um, now, whoever put that in was the choice of that local committee of safety to put in. They have the discretion to 
uh, do what they choose. Now, you're an anarchist. Can you start a committee of safety? Well, in 1774, uh, they were anarchists, weren't they? Huh? Yeah, I, I, yeah, they, they didn't have a government. They 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 they, uh, um, they rejected the government and had no form of government. No, they didn't have a constitution to adhere to. They didn't even have the Articles of Confederation. So they were anarchists. They just said, "Screw you, big government. We're going to create our own little government here." So they were anarchists. So um, are they mutually exclusive? No. It just depends on when you uh, when a committee of safety is formed. What do they, how do they want to uh, compose themselves? And another instance in there and, uh, has to do with um, recognition of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Not the anti-slavery amendment, but the other one called the Titles of Nobility Amendment. Yep, 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 yep. Um, some of them prohibit bankers, policemen, lawyers from joining the Committee of Safety because they have accepted titles of nobility or honor, which is what the 13th Amendment talks about. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's an option locally, too. And so when I talk to people about committees of safety, you know, why is that there? Well, this is why it's there. You have to decide what you want. You know, I'm not going to – there are no rigid rules. The community – the, the committee of safety represents that community. They have to determine what their criteria is. If it's okay. not suitable, they can change it. So anarchists can start it. They can participate in it unless the local people say, screw you, anarchists. We don't like you. Okay, or fair, screw fair you, enough. cops. We don't like you. Or screw you, bankers or lawyers. We don't like you. You know, it's okay, um, so, I'm, so I'm it's gonna, essentially you know, up to oh, – go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Gary. Yeah. Uh, uh, Harney County Committee of Safety, uh, looking into that, the one – and I th think we're going to discuss that a little bit later on. But I, I want to touch okay. on a point here. Uh, Forty-six percent of the people in Harney County, employed people, work for the government. <laughs> so they started a committee of safety. And so if they've gotten a, a, a good sampling out of the community, uh, they can expect that 46 percent of the people uh, are government, maybe even more. So my recommendation to them would be uh, – have a meeting, say those that support the federal government stand against that wall, those that have a problem with the federal government stand against this wall, and then do what they did in Worcester, Massachusetts. Okay, you, those of you standing against that wall, your Tories get out of here. <laughs> because what they've done is what the Muslims did in Dearborn, Michigan. They eventually overload the voting system. So perhaps the federal government's encouraging their people to water down the effectiveness of the Harney County Committee of Safety by encouraging participation and maybe a bonus if you join the Committee of Safety and vote in favor of the federal government. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely possible. So essentially, it just comes down to um, whoever, whoever. I guess the uh, is it would it be called the board or whatever the the or well, the community well, uh, more generally what they decide to to put in like the bylaws then. Well, I don't know if it was true in all communities of safety. The ones that I've got a good grasp on on the information available, especially Albany, New York, they had an executive committee and a general association. The general association is the people that subscribed the Committee of Safety. The executive board was referred to by the same name, the Committee of Safety, but they dealt with the mundane task. But if anything important came up, then they would uh, make a recommendation and go to the General Association to get concurrence in their decision. Uh, so uh, even though they were both, as near as I can tell, they're both referred to as the Committee of Safety. Uh, I'm not sure how they worked it, but you had the executive board and they could only hold office for a year in Albany. But in other places, people were there the entire period of the existence. So, again, we're back to how do you want to structure your committee of safety? But the concept of general association, yeah, we'll hold off because you, uh, there, there's, uh, we're going to get into that. I yep, think, sure. correct. Yep, and that, that's actually the the next point. So it's it's kind of good you brought up the the general association. This is something I was kind of interested in. Uh, is anyone in the defined scope of the committee of safety? So we'll say Harney County in this example. Is everyone in uh, Harney County guaranteed protection by that committee of safety, or is it limited to those who have like or who have who have already voluntarily consented to it? Well, uh, again, that's a local option. But uh, and again, and with discussions recently of people starting committees of safety. Uh, they were looking at how to get uh, people to, to join the Committee of Safety. And so one of my recommendations, if there's a little old lady 
down the street that needs her house painted, go paint her house. Does she have to join the committee of safety? No, but hey, she might just because you painted her house. Little old man can't push the lawnmower anymore. Go mow his lawn for him. Uh, but it's it, it, again, we're back to a local option. Uh, it's for the community, but it per, is it only for the participants or is it for everybody? That's the local option because there's no we live in a rigid society, you know, lawyers can only talk law, you can't talk law, uh, you know, it, it's compartmentalized. You, you, mm -hmm. When I was a kid, you went to the doctor. Now you go to the specialist. No matter what it is, there's a specialist. True. Uh, so we've compartmentalized. We've, we've said you're not smart enough to think for yourself. you got to go pay this guy to think for you. And if you go to court, that's a disaster. So uh, the freedom to, for the community to decide where they're going with what they're creating is bottom-up government, isn't it? We don't have to compartmentalize. We can think for ourselves and say what's best for this community. Can we modify it later on? We damn sure can. Why not? There's no rigid rules for the Committee of Safety. Okay. Except okay, okay. that you're filling in where the other government fails to provide. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, so uh, um, this is a kind of intriguing question. Have uh, in the past have committees of safety ever collected taxes? Well, the uh, Central Florida Committee of Safety. Yeah, we. Uh, I guess you could call it a tax. We didn't call it a tax. It was a contribution, and we asked everybody to put a dollar in the the jar at every meeting if they could afford it. So it was I guess that's a form of a form of taxation. And from what I can tell back there, there was no assessment of taxes, but there were voluntary uh, 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 commitments of material or or money uh, to do it. Uh, they did raise money somehow in, in Albany. I can't figure out how they did it, but they had money, so they might have had some dues or something. But I know when the committees of safety, when Boston was embargoed. Uh, committees of safety from around the area were sending uh, wagon loads of blankets, wagon loads of firewood, herds of sheep, herds, uh, uh, I guess it's not a herd of pigs, and even <laughs> cattle. And so I don't know who paid for those. I can, you know, history, the history I've found does not record that. Uh, but it appears, as near as I can tell, that uh, there was never an assessment. And so what we did in Central Florida, uh, asking for a, a contribution if you can afford it, was the closest that I've ever heard of to what you might call a tax. Okay, and and that and from what you've explained, uh, I, I guess other than other than what what you what you aren't aware of or what you can't figure out with Albany, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's it wouldn't be taxation then. Um, reason being, like uh, you, you explained, that you asked for contributions, you didn't force anyone to toss a dollar in, um, so it was it was voluntary. Or for those that that joined to pay, and they they consented to the dues, like if it was twenty bucks a month or something like that, uh, they consented to the dues, and if they didn't want to pay it, they just they could just not be in the committee of safety. So yeah, I guess right. Uh, from or what if you they explained, went out, it wasn't taxation. Right. If they went out and cut down the 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 wood for the forts, uh, whatever it was, it, it appears that. It was a voluntary uh, contribution for the good of the community, something that we leave in the hands of government today. And there's the big problem. We look at government as the, the end all. They do everything for us. We can't do anything without their consent. Back then, the world wasn't that way. So I would expect that people uh, would help you build a barn and uh, support the Committee of Safety by the means that you could afford to support the Committee of Safety by uh, uh, work, by uh, product, or by uh, monetarily, voluntarily. Uh, we've got to get out of our heads. In fact, a lot of the research I do, a lot of the diaries and things that I read, I want to get into the heads of the people that lived back then. They looked at the world completely differently than we do now, but if we look at George Washington owned slaves and Thomas Jefferson uh, owned slaves and, and he, he got one of them pregnant. Well, they haven't proven that. His father was known to have slept with the slaves and he would have, that we would have the same DNA from the father that they would get from the son. True. Yeah, true. So, uh, but we want to demonize them even though these were acceptable practices then. We want to impose our morality and our perception of government on what they did 200 years ago. And that's wrong 200 years from now. How are people going to look at our form of government? 
And are they going to hold it to their moral values and their civic values and their uh, religious values, whatever values they might hold? Are they going to damn us? You can't damn the past for the way they were because that's what how we got to where we are. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, last uh, um, last uh, couple questions here for the history, and then I do want to get into uh, the actual direct action uh, for Mr. Producer's purposes and also for the listeners. Uh, we'll probably go over just a little bit in this one because we've still got to get through security teams and the, the, the direct action of the form forming the Committee of Safety. But, uh, uh, Gary, how many committees of safety are there uh, right now? Well, it's hard to say. There's, uh, I think, three or four signed up on the Committee of Safety page, but that's totally voluntary. There's no requirement for it. We know the Harney County Committee of Safety exists, and I've heard of a few others, how effective they are, how active they are. I don't know. Uh, again, uh, well, why don't you make these people sign up at your page? I can't make anybody do anything. You know, the, the, this is totally voluntary. We've got to... Uh, uh, go with what we've got. But uh, so as far as operational right now, um, Harney County is the most recent. I know they've had a couple meetings, but I don't know the results of those meetings. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got about uh, seven and a half minutes or eight minutes till break. Uh, so let's get into kind of the, the introduction to uh, the, the actual formation of a committee of safety. So uh, how does uh, how does one form a committee of safety? Well, again, we're running into the same thing. However, uh, the two that I've been involved uh, more so in, in creating are South Bend, Indiana, which was when I was up there and they were forming it, I, I helped them with it. And the other one was in 1994 in uh, the Central Florida Committee of Safety, where, uh, and that's the one that I worked it all the way through. Um, we put out uh, uh, notices. We got uh, contacted lo uh, local t news stations, uh, local radio stations. We didn't hit the press. There was only one real paper in Orlando at the time, the Orlando Sentinel. Um, and I don't know if they carried anything or not, but we had uh, made arrangements for a, a fairly large room at the library. And fortunately, it was large enough to hold the a uh, couple hundred people that uh, came up to the meeting even had hmm. press there with their cameras, even though we told them no cameras inside. And they'll respect when the government says that. They snuck a camera in for ours, but uh, <laughs> we're not going to fault them for that. Just, but uh, uh, So we got good coverage ahead of time and had the meeting, and I explained committees of safety. And uh, so we had oh, about 40 or 50 people subscribe, and then the executive board was created. However, the, our meeting time was over, and the first chairman was elected on the street uh, in, or on the sidewalk in front of the building, and the big mistake was we should have taken more time because he was a sovereign citizen, Ooh. and he wanted to limit back to <laughs> local rules, wanted to limit the Committee of Safety participation to people who were sovereign citizens. <laughs> Um, and in, eventually, uh, it, it became quite a rub. And it, uh, after I left Orlando, it uh, resulted in the demise of the Central Florida Committee of Safety. Um, okay, okay. So, so vetting is obviously important in a Committee of Safety as well. Que uh, you, you, a question you mentioned, uh, like obviously uh, the people are elected by the community. Uh, is there a requirement? Oh, I guess this would be this would be another one of those answers, I'm sure. But I feel it's worth asking since we since Liberty Under Attack does promote the cancellation of the voter registration. Do they have to be registered voters to to vote in like a Committee of Safety to vote on positions? No, they have to be subscribers to the Committee of Safety. Okay. All right. I mean, that was just a question. We, we, we asked the question, do you have to be a subscriber to uh, be afforded the protection of the Committee of Safety? No, uh, that's up to the Committee of Safety. But the vote, you have to be a subscriber to the Committee of Safety, the General Association. Uh, you can't have Muslims voting in a Committee of Safety. Uh, did I? I can't say that, can I? Okay, okay. So, you can't so have Tories voting in it either, Harney County. You can't have Tories voting in it either. If, if the <laughs> king control the committees of safety, we wouldn't be the United States of America, would we? No, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but any, any, any restriction has to be, should be on a, a, uh, uh, a, a well-reasoned uh, consideration why to exclude a group of people or a class of people. 
Okay. Okay. Understood. Understood. Um, so, <clears throat> obviously, these are the, obviously as we kind of we found out, it's up to the up to the uh, specific committee of safety um, what what laws they want to have and such. Uh, but just for for the sake of the listeners that may be interested in actually starting up a, com- a committee of safety, um, maybe just let them know um, what you did in these circumstances uh, or how how this was done. Um, and uh, obviously, they can if they're interested in starting it, they can do the same thing or they can do something different. But um, just so that just so that they have kind of uh, uh, some sort of a, a, a very very loose blueprint on on how to actually go about doing it. So uh, the committee of safety is formed. Uh, what's next? Are there bylaws that need to be adopted? Uh, what's the next action uh, the organi- organization should take uh, once it's formed? Well, the bylaws, uh, and there are a number of examples uh, available, there are some in the zip file at committee.org, um, have, again, have to suit who can be a member, uh, the provisions like that, how officers are elected, what their term is. Uh, any organization to run has to have a degree of rules to determine how they run. Otherwise, you've just got chaos, uh, you know. Hey, I think we ought to paint my house. Uh, all in favor? Uh, I'll buy a beer for everybody that votes in favor of painting my house. You know you, that cannot uh, be the case. But yes, they again have to be thought out. Do we have a model from history? I can't find one. So uh, again, you know, the thinking people need to come up. Uh, either take the, uh, the the bylaws that are presented in that package, and I think we've got both. Uh, South Bend and uh, Central Florida. We may have some others, but uh, look at them, see if they suit you. If they don't, uh, change them to uh, be accommodating. But you've got to have uh, some form of order to it. You know what your purpose is and and all that. So, but as far as starting it, uh, you know, I've seen committees of safety as small as three people. Now, Hancock said five people or three is a majority. So what is it taken? At what point do we create an executive committee? Uh, it's cumbersome if you've got 30 or 40 people for everybody to participate in the discussion all the time. Uh, one of the, uh, the bylaws for South Bend and I think for Central Florida talk about subcommittees who, when an issue comes up within their subject matter, there's another one in there. We started the Arizona Committee of Safety, a state level, and that was a fiasco. You can't start at the state level. you got to start down here and work your way up to it. Uh, but we set up subcommittees to deal with certain things, and then they would uh, save all that discussion time at the board by coming with their recommendation to approve something or not approve something, and their reasoning why, and cut the discussion down. So from a functionary standpoint, having subcommittees, if you're large enough, having these subcommittees to hash out the details and come up with a, a good proposal and a good justification for a proposal um, is efficient. It's expedient. It gets the job done. Okay. Okay. And uh, we are coming to the second break here. Uh, i got a, a few more uh, questions for you regarding uh, the actual formation. Then we'll dive into uh, security teams. Uh, but, yeah, if you've uh, got a question uh, for Gary, uh, regarding committees of safety at this point or uh, um, or security teams uh, later on, feel free to give us a call, 218-895-3818, or on Skype at FPRN Radio Live, uh, or you can obviously uh, type it in the chat as always. So stay tuned. We're, we'll be right back after this short break. And welcome back to Liberty Under Attack Radio here on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. Uh, we are joined by Gary Hunt from the Outpost of Freedom blog to discuss uh, committees of safety and security teams for the premiere of the direct action series which will run uh probably up until march to be uh to be quite honest so uh gary welcome back uh so let's get uh, right back into it then uh so uh gary if there is uh, already a committee of safety in uh, someone in uh, someone's area how do they find it and uh and become a member well uh as i said it's, it's voluntary whether people sign up on the uh uh or, or list their uh Committee of Safety on the committee.org page, uh, but there is a link there that uh, is there a committee of safety near you, I think is what it's called in one of the pop downs. If you go there, it shows the states where people have uh, either uh, registered theirs or uh, will actually put pages up there if they want a place to put it. You know, they can go get their own domain or they can have one at committee.org. Uh, 
but it, it's voluntary. And so I can't say that's a good source of, of finding out where they are because only those that decide to list them there exist. And I'm whether they're still in existence or not, there were two in Florida, one in Geneva, Florida, and one over in the Tampa Bay area that never registered there. I think the Geneva one's still active, but it was kind of a an isolated community, a five-acre uh, uh, lot subdivision where they were looking at protecting their uh, their area. And so they're, they didn't go out of their reach, so they never listed it. Uh, they just, you know, the neighbor told neighbor. There weren't that many people. The one in, uh, I think it was Hillsborough County, never registered with us, and they were going for a while, and I was in touch with them, but I've not stayed in touch. Uh, uh, Harney County has not registered with us yet, and uh, that's up to them whether they do or not. So, you know, it's just a Again, uh, you do what each committee does what they want. If they want, they should promote themselves within their own community. And what better way than having a listing at committee.org? Uh, but they should encourage participation uh, of like minded people. And when I say like minded people, the people that feel that the government is failing to fulfill some or uh, some of its duties, or perhaps exceeding itself in, in performing other duties. <laughs> that they want to create that parallel government to uh, to moderate things, let's say, to be polite about it. Okay. Um, and uh, um, as I mentioned uh, um, in the uh, introduction, I think it was, uh, we, we had you on for the creation of, the, of political prisoners. Uh, could committees of safety have, uh, like if there was one up where uh, William Wolf was or if there was one where, uh, where Casey Massey was, could, could, could committees of safety have, have assisted them in, in, in uh, I guess, keeping them out of uh, the government dungeons? <laughs> The militia, uh, it, now, Maryland Constitution and maybe some others still recognize this. The militia shall always be subordinate to the civil authority. Well, in a normal context, back then they were subordinate to the royal government in, you know, the, the governments created by the royal charters, uh, but they transferred their allegiance to the committees of safety as the committees of safety formed. Um, can the Committee of Safety do anything? Well, they could hire a law, raise funds and hire a lawyer, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, you know, that very serious question, uh, uh, well, it occurred with the Hammonds. Uh, do they want to uh, avoid being arrested? The Hammonds said, no, we are going to turn ourselves in. So, uh, and Kim Davis, the Oath Keeper, said, I uh, wanted to go down there and protect her. And she said, I don't want to say fuck off, so I won't. <laughs> uh, screw off! Uh, I don't want you down here. Uh, okay. So, so the committee of safety would decide uh, what uh, they wanted to do, and if they uh, had a militia that subordinated to that civil authority, which you know we see the word militia uh, slung around quite a bit, mm -hmm. but again, the uh, militia subordinates to the civil authority, and it's kind of problematic to call somebody. Well, there's 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 lowercase m, m militia and there's uppercase m militia. Uh, everybody by uh, I think it's 10 U.S. Code 311, and by their own state st uh, constitution and statutes, uh, between 18 and 45 generally, okay. and uh, in many cases, uh, male and female, other cases male only, are are militia. They're the lowercase m. Correct. Uh, they That's are true. militia. They are by law. They're militia. They don't realize it. They'll condemn militias, but they're militia. The <laughs> uppercase Sam then is one that comes together as a body. Now, at that point, they have to subordinate to civil authority. So the, absent a committee of safety, the only civil authority that they can subordinate to would be the state governor. So in the case of Arizona, we'd actually prepared uh, a series of correspondence to request the governor uh, and then the county commission to become the civil authority, expecting that they would deny it. And at that point, the committee of safety was the only remaining civil authority that they could subordinate to. Uh, they could have gone directly to the committee of safety if they chose. But otherwise, they're only lowercase militia. And the press keeps calling them a militia group, militia this, militia that. Well, hell, the people that vote in the elections are, are mostly militia. Uh, <laughs> You know the 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 press's abuse of our language is is phenomenal. Without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt, yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Um, so since we since we've kind of mentioned uh, since you mentioned Harney County, uh, is there any potential for uh, confrontations with law enforcement or governmental agencies due to involvement with COS? I I, I know it it didn't occur because uh, obviously the the higher power back in the revolutionary times um, they kind of. I mean, they they work together and they uh, coordinate and such. But uh, today, w is there a is there a possibility for confrontations with uh, law enforcement or uh, governmental well, agencies? Think about it. What happened in April 1975? A lot of those militias were still subordinate to the civil authority, but they had committees of safety and they shifted their allegiance and they wouldn't shot redcoats. So the potential for violence uh, can come in that moment that they say we change our allegiance. Um, in Harney uh, County, the, one of the problems is uh, a large percentage of them were pro-fed. Uh, that's not a dog food. That's what they were. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you know, you run into that interesting situation. Now, once they get to that point, um, let me give you a little background on the Harney County Committee of Safety. Ryan Payne was down here. He spent about eight or ten days with me. And we were preparing a, P a PowerPoint presentation that is uh, currently incomplete because Ryan's found other things to do with his time, including Skylar Barbeau and uh, um, uh, the, the, the Hammond Harney thing. Um, but uh, we had talked about it, and he passed that on to Ammon Bundy, and together they talked the people in Harney County into creating a committee of safety. They have the, uh, a webpage already, uh, the Harney County Committee of Safety, and I think it's HCC. Uh, uh, that link is actually in the chat, H HCC okay. Committee of Safety dot org. Yep, I went ahead and posted that in the chat right. so people could get an idea of, of of what it would look like as far as like the website and what they do. So, yep, that one is in the in the chat right now. Yep. And, but what uh, led is, to the what led to the creation when the Hammonds would not ask for the aid of the militia, uh, or the uh, what I prefer to, uh, to and have recommended is uh, uh, freedom loving Americans to come to the aid of uh, the Hammonds, and they rejected that. That uh, it was proposed to uh, to Ryan that uh, uh, if Harney County asks us to come and intervene if the uh, state government asked us to intervene or if they create a committee of safety and they come and ask us to intervene. So that was what motivated the creation of the Hardy County Committee of Safety. However, uh, conflict and, the, and get back to that scenario, Tories on one side and, and uh, Harney County, uh, people who care about Harney County on the other, um, it seems that the Tories impeded the possibility of any request to come and uh, freedom-loving Americans to come and uh, help defend Harney County against federal intrusion, which okay. I think was the recommended was along the lines of the recommended wording. So they never got to the point, but they're t they haven't felt their full power yet, and you know I I don't know where they're going to go with that. Had they been in existence for a while and and realized, uh, well, you've heard the phrase state of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in a committee of safety, in a sense, you're in a, a state of nature because you've said the government doesn't exist around me. I am in Rome. I have to do as the Romans do. But otherwise, I'm in a state of nature. And I've been that way since 1993. Um, you have to be, but like I've told your friend Kyle Reardon, uh, the state of na nature is a state of mind more than anything. You know, it's not going to get you a, a cup of coffee. It and a dime ain't going to get you a cup of coffee or anything else. But it's a state of mind where you have rejected the, uh, the unconstitutional government, uh, for want of a better phrase, that exists. I reject it. You know, I have no respect for them at all. Uh, they got the guns, though, and so compliance comes at the uh, point of the bayonet, so to speak. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. But the important state of mind is that, and uh, the Harney County Committee of Safety obviously has not evolved to the point where they recognize state of nature, whether it was presented to them or not. But until you get that uh, distinct uh, sense of we have a right to control our own destinies – which is what happened back in 1774 and 
1775, uh, you're going to be ineffective, but at least you've started the uh, the, the progression. Uh, let me reference one of my articles that uh, I don't know if you've got the link to it, but it's called The Other Not-So-Thin Lion, uh, because it's kind of important in understanding where this concept of uh, state of nature and and feeling what I have a right to do, not what the government tells me I have a right to do, but what I have a right to do under the Constitution, well, whether it be uh, possess firearms or speak freely or anything else. You know, I'm not relying on their interpretation of free speech. I can understand why you can't yell fire in a theater. <laughs> but beyond that, there are very few limitations on freedom of speech. Uh, there should be, but the government is imposing them. I can't say nigger. I can say Negro. They can say nigger. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know who gay people are. I know who queers are. Uh, so I reject uh, the norm, but the norm has been forced on us by government. If I say queer, it's a hate crime. If I say gay, it might not be. Uh, you know, and they're using the laws to enforce this verbicide on us, which gives a different connotation. That's the world we live in. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. So last, last question on committees of safety, and we'll kind of get that wrapped up and move on to security teams. Uh, should a committee of safety use encrypted communications? Uh, if a committee of safety is local to begin with, so anything done should be done in their forum, uh, in their meetings. Now, mm -hmm. if it's something of controversy, it depends on how well they have vetted their people because in every instance of somebody getting busted, there's always an informant involved. And there sure. could be one in, in your local committee of safety. So the executive committee especially should be well vetted in case they even want to discuss something, whether they decide to do or not to do. That discussion could be considered criminal by the government because they'll find a way to get there, as we've discussed with the political prisoners. Mm -hmm. So uh, the communication should be direct uh, if it gets serious. You need to make sure the room's debugged. Or go out in the middle of the woods and talk. Um, now, as far as this is the world we live in, though, we everybody, you know, if it's down, the guy's down the street, why carry a message down to him? I can email him. I can chat him. I can text him. Yep. Uh, if you can, if you're t we're talking about communication on the Internet, especially, say, via email, um, I don't know if you've discussed it before. I know I've talked with Kyle about it extensively, what I call double encryption. You encrypt something using any of the old codes. There are plenty available. There are a lot of methods uh, that uh, you can encrypt something by hand. So if mm -hmm. I encrypt something by hand, now let's just say I use PGP or one of these others. What if there is a backdoor? Uh, if you watch the video, uh, uh, the movie Citizen Four, which is about Eric Snowden, they're talking about how if the government gets if, uh, gets a chance to get uh, your uh, password, uh, your, uh, your key, uh, key uh, they can intervene. They can extract information. He was so concerned about that, and he knows more than you and I do about the, the True, thing. Yeah. So I think there's legitimacy. So even if PGP is secure, um, if if they get the keyword, uh, then th they can listen to what you're saying. So what happens now if I've encrypted it and then I type it in my computer and there's also keystroke capturing, you know, if you get all these smartphones and everything, are they actually giving the government your keystrokes? Uh, but if I type it in encrypted already and then PGP it and they decrypt it through a back door or any other means, what do they got? <laughs> this garbage in, garbage out to them. So True, yeah. now all of a sudden they've got another step to go through. Now, if it's timely communication, how long will it take? And and Snowden in Citizen Four talks about that. You know, it might not serve long, but it'll give us enough time to get the job done. Uh, so you've delayed their progression if they even want to pursue it beyond. Hey, I wonder if they change the logarithm and we just the back door doesn't work anymore. Well, just throw it aside, man. We can't read it. <laughs> uh, that's a good possibility because they've got to commit manpower. So how important are you? Uh, so there are ways that you can communicate electronically, but to get some online, uh, well, they they got into uh, Bitcoin, didn't they? Or uh, no, Silk Road, didn't they? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, So uh, that's a demonstration of uh, how vulnerable you are when you rely on what's readily available on the Internet, whether you pay for it or it's free. Uh, I like to, I got to kick out a burn note because you got to watch the note burn up. Hey, the note no longer exists. Bullshit. Their servers probably got every <laughs> note that was ever sent on burn note. Yeah. And, you know, in the, uh, you know, the, an email, uh, unlike a letter, if, if they get a letter and open the envelope, hey, you might find traces of it, especially if whoever sent the envelope uh, seals it well. Uh, but an email, they can extract a copy of the email that t- has digital age versus analog age uh, that has no evidence that they've received a copy of it. So they've got to play with it, and you never know that they got it. So how can you trust anything on the Internet unless you do, do something like a double encryption where you've at, at best made their job extremely difficult because the first they have to d- get into it, and then they got to figure out what they got into <laughs> yeah, true, so, true. Uh, otherwise, couriers uh, who have to be trusted, um, direct communication, uh, there are ways to communicate. Now, uh, you know, I know some patriots are working on different ones, but other people have mastered them already. For example, the Muslims seem to be able to transmit uh, messages in images. Uh, you know, somehow they go into the, uh, I'm not sure how, but when, if you look at a, uh, you know, the, the text version of a JPEG, for example, you see just uh, a series of code. Could I go yeah. in there and insert a, uh, uh, a word every once in a while? It would never be noticed because the effect on the overall JPEG image would never show. It was just another pixel out of place or something. Uh, there might be methods like that, uh, but I would think that then searching for, known words just uh, uh, would, would could detect those. I don't know. I'm not that smart. Uh, okay. So to me, the double encryption is the only safe way to communicate beyond personal communications. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, so that was all I had for uh, Kamaze of Safety. Um, let's move forward to security teams. Uh, we're a little behind, which I, I kind of expected because there's a, a lot of material to cover here. Uh, but let's get on to uh, security teams. Uh, what is yeah, well, a security team? Yeah, oh, I very, also have very long answers. So. Oh, and that, no, that's that, that's definitely fine. The last time we had John, it was it was almost it was almost three hours. Um, so I, I, we're definitely probably going to go over this time, but uh, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near three hours. So uh, yeah, not a problem. Uh, well, so what? Uh, are, yep, go ahead. Security team. Uh, back in uh, '92, I think it was. Uh, I was writing uh, articles, bad articles about the government. I had some friends, George Sibley and Linda Lyon, they were writing Liberatus magazine. And we had some friends, and we decided that it's not a militia. It was just us looking out for our collective uh, protection. Uh, We had no idea where it was going to go. Initially, it was five of us, and then we weren't going to add any more. But George was a member, but Linda was not. But Linda uh, was brought in even after we decided not to bring anybody in. But then the the, the door closed, and so our security team, um, you know, the uh, the other names I still won't divulge. There's one I referred to as Sam because he was instrumental in things. That's not his real name, but George, Linda, Gary, Sam, and a couple other people were our security team, and they all somewhere along the line played a, a very uh, involved role in what we didn't really anticipate at at beginning. A lot of it revolved around uh, my going to Waco, and then uh, later it evolved around George and Linda when they were accused of killing a cop in Opelika, Alabama. Uh, But the idea was we are uh, working together for our own protection. if there were any other people to come in, they would come under a, an individual. For example, if Gary wanted to have a subordinate security team, he could create one, but he would never know who the other members of the top level were. There might be some key that would be given to him to put an ad in the paper, if something happened to Gary, to put an ad in the paper that said this, and then he would have to compare the uh, torn dollar bill with the one to the person that responded to the ad that would be, uh, be able to pass it on to somebody. So 
you would never lose complete communication with that. But uh, they would never know the other tiers unless and until it was time to bring all the, any and all the teams together for a more defensive action, which has been anticipated for over 20 years and only occurs like places like Kearney County, uh, Wyoming, Texas, our message, uh, Montana, Texas, Washington, and Georgia. Uh, what you were talking about earlier, coming to the protection of the members. It's not a committee of safety, though, because it's not a public entity. It's a private, every right we have, uh, self-defense. The most important right we have has to be protection of our life, because mm -hmm. without our life, none of the other rights mean shit. True. So uh, <laughs> that right of self-defense is, is fundamental. And it was written in the Constitution. So if we read John Bad Elk in an 1899 Supreme Court decision, we begin to understand how sacred that right of self-defense is uh, and protection of your life, even against unlawful arrest. Um, so the concept here was that exactly that, the, our, the protection of our lives. Uh, in regard to if the government got to where they didn't like us. And I don't want to go into the detail, but like I say, after Waco, they were instrumental in affording uh, an assurance of my protection for uh, almost two months before we kind of gave that up. Uh, and then George and Linda in disposing of potential evidence that might be used, uh, might be gotten by the government and used against the people that uh, they had been in communication with. Uh, so, you know, it served a purpose we didn't anticipate. Now, I have gotten permission from all the members uh, to talk about it with the exclusion of names because mm -hmm. of what we learned in that experiment uh, as a, uh, a security team. Uh, there's a similar concept called leaderless resistance, which isn't quite what it sounds. Uh, it basically, are, uh, under the... Uh, concept of leaderless resistance doesn't mean there's not a leader in the group. That's up to the group. What it means is there's no leader outside of the group. And so, mm. the you know, we didn't engineer the concept, but we kind of played our way through and developed a very functional system that was uh, effective when the call came out, those two instances when the call came out for them to re uh, Respond. Actually, there was a third instance, uh, and that had to do with uh, uh, the FBI looking for Peter Chernoff, uh, Linda Issel, and Peterson Alexander, where we hid them from the federal government. So there were three instances where the security team functioned beautifully. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so just to reiterate this for, because you, you kind of already mentioned, it's a private. It's a private. Uh, a pr it's, a, it's private, it's not public, but uh, just for the benefit of the listeners, security teams are uh, underground. You don't, uh, uh, you don't go tell people that you're in a security team. You don't do anything like that. This is completely private between you and the, and the people that you uh, um, would potentially uh, s start a security team with uh, for, for uh, self-defense and such. So um, Right. Yeah. And until I was given permission to talk about it for educational purposes, if it would help others, uh, I couldn't even discuss the existence of it with anybody that wasn't a member of the team. Um, the um, We did bring other people in, but they never knew the team existed. I, I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, and it was underground, and uh, just for the benefit of people, we didn't anticipate that they were – uh, actively pursuing us, but when we met, we'd meet at my office because it was kind of central, and we'd decide where we would go to eat lunch and have our meetings. And when we got there, uh, you know, the first five or ten minutes, we wanted to make sure who came in and where they sat. Yep. But by by picking our restaurant, we were making sure that somebody couldn't go in and put a microphone under the table ahead of us. So we didn't have to stick our head under the table or anything like that. And then looking at the characters that might have followed us, if somebody came in and started looking at us strangely, which never did happen, but we felt we could judge that somebody was there, would sit near us to, to hear or things like that. But, so it never happened. But that was the kind of a security that we didn't need, but we practiced to make it a habit. So all of our meetings were conducted under the, the, the location of the meeting was never called until we met together physically in one place. Okay. Uh, so those practices, you can think them out yourself on how to 
get in the habit of being secure. Yep, yep, and I, I think that's uh, I think that's very very important, and that is uh, another aspect on uh, the direct action list that we'll cover is security culture. And uh, in order to, uh, you'll need a good understanding of security culture before you uh, start a security team, um, which uh, obviously uh, Gary's team did have, uh, as you just heard him kind of explain. Uh, but we're coming to this final break here. And uh, when we come back, we'll get into, uh, obviously, uh, the formation of a security team and uh, some other interesting uh, subjects uh, relating to it. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, give us a call. Uh, 218-895-3818 or on Skype at FPRN Radio Live. And uh, we'll be right back after this short break. We are joined by Gary Hunt from the Outpost of Freedom blog. Uh, we just wrapped up talking about committees of safety and just got into uh, security teams. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions on security teams, feel free to give us a call, 218-895-3818, or on Skype at FPRN Radio Live. Uh, and I do have my co-host Stan with me uh, as well. Uh, Stan, you still there, brother? Yes, I am. Okay, okay. Uh, any thoughts so far on uh, on, on what you've uh, heard about committees of safety and uh, security teams? Um. You know, I like a lot what he was said about uh, double encryption because that's one thing I kind of see happen a lot is we kind of get our uh, PGB codes and we kind of stick to them. But how long does it take, you know, that to be cracked or what have you? Um, You know, using a secondary method allows you to, so as it were, uh, keep moving as far as your encryption goes. Yeah. Yeah, an extra measure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Make things twice as hard. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And as exactly. hard as you can make it for the government, the better. Exactly. And uh, I, initially when I started getting interested in encryption, well, actually before that, I was just like, well, the NSA can crack anything. So like, I, 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 I had this, the same mentality that uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the mainline public does. Well, I'm, I don't have anything to hide. But uh, then I thought of it from a different way, and I, I do think encryption can be, can be useful as far as uh, encryption. Uh, but uh, if you encrypt it, that makes it just that much harder for the government. I, make, I just want to make it as hard on them as possible if they're going right. to try to read what, I, read what I write or anything like that. Get back to uh, security teams. We are running out of time here this evening. But uh, anyways, Gary, uh, what kind of uh, operations does a security team perform? Uh, well, I briefly mentioned three, and I'll go into a little more detail on them. When I returned from Waco, there was a concern that uh, the FBI had moved into the room next to mine at uh, the new roadie, and I was in room 223. They got room 221. And when they did, uh, a funny thing happened. Uh, this is about four or five days before the fire. Uh, all of a sudden, if there, somebody knocked on their door, it sounded like my door. And so we kind of figured that they, they had uh, – uh, put some device in that used our, our wall, uh, you know, a probe that used our wall as a diaphragm to uh, hear what we were saying, but at the same time it was transmitting sound back to our wall as a diaphragm to hear the knock on their door sounding like it was a knock on my door. Um, and we also, from the, uh, not the, ma- uh, yeah, the manager, um, found out that when they checked in, they were FBI, the government was paying for their room, they requested the room next to mine, and at the same time, some other agents came in and asked where the equipment room was. Uh, now, the equipment room in a motel is where uh, primarily the telephone communications uh, connection boards are, are established. Mm-hmm. So uh, it seemed like they wanted to tap the phone. So all of a sudden, we had to look at ad- advanced security and, and communication. So we developed some where uh, by uh, other means, we would get somebody else to send a phone number to somebody that wanted to talk to me, uh, and it would be a pay phone that I was at, and they would uh, it would be at at a certain time, and I would go to that pay phone and get the phone call. So we uh, got around the, uh, the 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 calls there, and so we could we could say what we want the government to hear over the phone, and we could say what they didn't uh, we didn't want them to hear otherwise. And so when I was leaving, there was concern because uh, Church Universal and Triumphant, uh, Claire Prophet up in Montana, had uh, bought an old tank and some military vehicles and fixed them up and had uh, legally owned bazookas and other uh, military artifacts. And she was a church, and the government was threatening her. And it was very similar to Waco, uh, except more open on, on their announcement that they were going to do things. And... Uh, 
so uh, I was I had talked to people already, and somebody had bought me a ticket waiting for me in Orlando to go up to Montana to get prepared for that event. Now, eventually, that fell apart. She turned over the equipment to the government and kind of you know gave up. But uh, there was a lot of concern for my safety because of my involvement in Waco. Uh, so we had to relatively openly talk about my return. And so kind of cryptically, uh, I'm sure that when I get off the plane, uh, everything will be okay. Uh, yeah, everything will be okay when you get off the plane. So when I got off the plane at Orlando, once I got out of the security area, there were three armed people in the airport uh, hmm. ready to make sure that I was safe. Uh, from there, we went to a motel room and uh, to see if there was any going to be any effort to arrest me, we set up with the local radio station where we would he came down to the motel room, uh, pre-recorded a, uh, a live call, and uh, then went back and uh, before he started the live call, he, uh, well, Gary's not here yet. I wonder where he is and went on for about five minutes. Oh, here he comes now uh, just to see what would happen. And then he played the, mm -hmm. the pre-recorded show. So we were taking precautions. Were they necessary? No. Did we? But at the time, we weren't sure of that. So uh, we began practicing uh those exercises. Now, before Waco, uh, I went there on March 5th. It's, uh, in mid-April, uh, a guy shows up at my door. Uh, well, four people showed up at my door. Uh, Peter Chernoff, uh, his son Alex, and his girlfriend, Linda Issel, and the guy that drove them from California. I don't know the guy's name from California. I don't want to know it. But he had driven them out from California. I didn't know them. But they had read some of the articles that had come out in my first edition of the Outpost of Freedom newspaper, and I had talked to some people that they knew, and they felt that this would be a safe place to hide uh, them from the FBI, who was after them, and actually uh, had set his bail at a half a million dollars, so it was pretty wow. serious. Yeah. And so uh, we brought him in. I brought him in, and. Uh, so we protected him. We moved him around a couple of times. Uh, oh, uh, let's go back to, to, to Waco first. Let me finish that. We also set up what we call dead man calling by four o'clock every day. And we could increase the frequency as necessary. I had to call to say that I was OK. There was a half an hour leeway on that uh, because I had my business and had work to do. Uh, but if I didn't make the call, then the person I was uh, was supposed to call that would notify the rest of this team, and they'd start scrambling now to find out what happened to Gary. It never went beyond the, the dead man, what we call dead man calling. But I've used that a few times since then when uh, when things get dicey, and you never can tell with the government, so it affords mm -hmm. a degree of protection. But then with Peter, we hid him. Uh, after I got back from Waco, uh, Linda wanted to go back to California, so we drove back together. Um, we had set some rigid rules from for Peter, and he broke the rules uh, and went and made a call from a payphone uh, to somebody back in California. So they knew he was where he was, so we had to move him again. So, uh, But eventually, he decided to turn himself in. But when he did, he uh, gave Alex to George and Linda and to take care of Alex. But then when he turned himself in, he told the damn police that Alex was with George and Linda. So they came and got uh, Alex from George and Linda. And the uh, funny story about that is George is walking around with his pistol uh, and Linda, both of them, were walking around with their pistol strapped on. Well, these guys came in and got Alex and looked around, uh, you know, did a search without a warrant. Uh, uh, but one of the, the cops said, you know, I feel kind of uncomfortable with you having that gun strapped on. And George looked back at him and said, I feel more uncomfortable with you having that gun strapped on in my house. <laughs> uh, That's a good response. But, but the security team shuffled them around and did everything to protect them. So we hid them from the FBI for about four months. Uh, so that was a role that we didn't anticipate when we formed it. The Waco one was a, a different one. The third event was uh, George and Linda 
ended up uh, shooting a cop in Opelika, Alabama, and then they were surrounded, and they had uh, their son with them, Linda's son with them, and uh, they were surrounded by cops, and, you know, were, do we shoot it out or not? And they decided not to shoot it out. They were eventually executed in Alabama. Uh, uh, Linda was the last uh, guest, uh, electric chair, uh, female electric chair, maybe the last electric chair death in Alabama, George, about wow. a le- year later, was uh, uh, the, you know the chemical treatment. Um, but they, uh, I had heard this story. Somebody contacted me when they found out they got arrested. And now these aren't on the blog, but they're on the committee uh, dash of dash uh, safety uh, dot com page. Uh, George Sibley and Linda Lyon. Uh, at first, when I got the story, I didn't know what ha- all had happened. I just had what had gone over mainstream media. And then finally, I got a phone call from Linda. But I was up in Connecticut on an Indian reservation. They were in Opelika, Alabama, in jail. And uh, the rest of the security team was down in Orlando, Florida area. And they had been using my fax machine in the office, which was one of the more sophisticated ones now. It wasn't thermal paper anymore. It was, uh, you know, bond paper. Uh, and it had the computer chips and everything. So every uh, fax that was ever sent out was recorded on it. And uh, Linda expressed her concern to me in the phone call that they didn't want that chip destroyed. Now, we didn't have time for secure communications. So here, rapid movement, we can always outrun the government. Rapid oh, movement yeah. was necessary. So after I got off the phone, I wa- called one of the security team members, told him where to get the key to get in my office. He got in the office, and his instructions were take the uh, fax machine, go out in the swamp. In Florida, there's plenty of swamps. Take an ax with you. Break the damn thing apart. Find all the electronic components in that. Break them even further and go at least 100 feet away from the machine and throw them in the, in the water. You know, distribute them uh, uh, in the water so they could never get back to the electronic components mm, uh, yeah. to find out where the transmission was. Uh, and in that case, we didn't have secure, any method of secure uh, communication, but we uh, figured uh, rapid movement. So he was instructed to go right now. As soon as we're done talking, you leave. You go to the office, get the key, go to the office, get the machine, go destroy it. So within uh, probably within three or four hours of the phone call, uh, the, the fax machine was history. Uh, so just to protect information in this case, uh, who they had faxed to because they had been they had a key and uh, they were allowed to use the fax machine all that they wanted, and yeah. uh, uh, so the, the the third exigency came up where the security came in and worked beautifully. Okay. okay. And that was the extent of it. And you know then I left. I stayed pretty much stayed out of Florida after that. George and Linda were in Opelika, and we were the the critical members. And so it, it basically disbanded. But like I said, I got permission from all the players uh, without divulging names to talk about our experience, to share them with other people so that they can think about the benefits of security team, even when they're unanticipated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that's definitely uh, it's definitely interesting. You've definitely been in, involved in some uh Interesting uh, situations, especially like considering Waco and such. But yeah, that's um, I'm glad I'm glad you're able to share that because that could definitely be good information for people who I don't know uh, people that uh, do uh, um, whether it be brazen civil disobedience or just uh, or just uh, whistleblowing or things of that nature. So yeah, it can definitely be useful. Uh, a couple more questions on security teams. Uh, what are uh, the skills that a security team should routinely train in? Well, the one I mentioned is our meetings. <laughs> Uh, it's a good one. Uh, you just, you know, they don't know where you're going to go. They can't pre-plant a bug, and you watch the people that come in. That's probably the most important because we had weekly meetings. Um, another one uh, that uh, we had, uh, I hate to use the bur- term bug out because it's been changed since then in its connotation, but yeah. if something drastic happened, we wanted uh, two assembly places. We were in Florida. Uh, the Wakiva River Basin is there, and so we had picked out two locations, Assembly Area A and Assembly Area B, where we knew where they were. Uh, 
Uh, if there was an ever uh, ever a need to use them, though, if there were any sub teams, uh, this was a rigid rule uh, that if I had a sub team and I called my team together, they wouldn't know why they came together. But then we went to the assembly area. If one guy said, "I got to call my wife," or had any excuse, shoot the motherfucker. Uh, and you know, hey, maybe it was innocent, but th- th- we could not take a risk. Once we divulged the location and began moving towards that assembly area, if it was otherwise, but we didn't want him to call and say, hey, follow us either. So it was very critical at what point uh, is the point of no return where you dispose of the, the, the potential threat. Uh, you don't have to, you, you can't stop and judge the morality. Uh, but so that practice that uh, our and we didn't really train for this, but in our minds, in our discussions, we co- uh, often went over it to make it a, a habitual aspect, even though it was never practiced. What we would do on in that event, and mm-hmm. uh, so uh, now, as far as other training, uh, that that was probably the extent of it. You know, each person uh, did or did not train with firearms of their choice and all that, but ours were primarily concerned with security, both uh, uh, in our, our regular meetings. Uh, well, the other one I mentioned were uh, on my team, I would pick one person to be maybe two people as well, uh, where if something happened to me and I, I trusted them, they would be able to make contact with other one other component of the security team and then come under their umbrella, but still not know the remainder. And that was by putting an ad in the paper and then having a, a, a half of a dollar bill that had to match one that the other person had. Okay. Uh, and that idea of using a, a dollar bill can be used over, and we discussed this, over a broader area if we knew of another security team elsewhere. Uh, and there was a possibility that something, uh, one point of contact here, one point of contact there for security purposes. If something happened to either, there's already been an arrangement made similarly, put the ad in the paper, uh, meet and compare dollar bills. Now, it's not foolproof by a long shot, but uh, it is a high degree of security, especially the dollar bill, because if somebody was uh, secured their dollar bill, had it well hidden or destroyed it, chewed it up. If they were arrested, then the ability to make the contact ceases to exist. They might yep. meet the person without the dollar bill. Fuck you, go away. <laughs> Pardon my language. Okay. But, oh, no, yeah. that's, that, that's, that's definitely fine. That's definitely fine. Um, all right, so I guess just a couple more questions to close out uh, security teams here. Um, and I think this is an important one to kind of broach. Because uh, I think there, there may be maybe some confusion uh, with uh, with some of the listeners here, but uh, what are the differences between a security team and a militia? A militia is uh, community oriented. It it uh, protects the geographic entity that is uh, component of. Uh, back to the revolution, there were t- uh, town committees of safety and town militias. Then there were county committees of safety and county militias. When you got the state level, though, the militias uh, were under command of the state, but they retained their leadership at the county level. Uh, so they're an organized, uh, and we've heard the, uh, the term organized and unorganized militia. Most states have adopted that to differentiate between the unorganized militia, the 18 to 45 year olds, uh, and the organized militia, which is National Guard, uh, Air National Guard, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the militia is organized, it subordinates to civil authority. Uh, the security team, we are our own civil authority. Uh, we're concerned uh, w- only with us, not with the community. Whether we might get involved in something in the community, uh, you know, we probably would if the need arose and would probably subordinate to, uh, as an entity, as a, I say, a, a militia squad or a militia unit to them without divulging the fact that we're a security team. Uh, but the distinction, quite simply, is one is the right to a personal self-defense and the other one is the right uh, uh, and minor collective, where the other one is a geographic uh, self-defense once they come together as the uppercase militia. Okay, okay. And uh, obviously you've already answered this question, but I, I guess obviously I'll just uh, – 
make sure this point is very, very clear. But uh, obviously, a security team should use encrypted communications, uh, as as Gary said. Internet might not be the best way, uh, but yeah, you should uh, you should definitely uh, uh, communicate discreetly. Uh, so, any any thoughts? Any further thoughts on that, or is that? Uh, <laughs> yes, understand that back in uh, 1993, 92, and 93, we didn't have the internet. You had Prodigy, AOL. Uh, the sophistication wasn't there. The government intrusion probably wasn't there. But uh, the security team being so local, the only time you'd communicate outside is if a security team here had one contact with another, uh, one individual contact with the other side. Uh, where there's a distance, then the, the, the same thing would be recommended. The dual encryption that we talked about would be about the only way you can, would uh, consider communicating absent personal face-to-face -face or courier communication. Okay. Okay. All right, and I guess we'll uh, we probably should start with this one. But nonetheless, so now that now that people have an idea of what a security a security team is, the security measures that need to be taken, and also uh, some of the uh, operations and the training that a security team should should uh, take part in, uh, how does one go about setting up a security team? Well, in our case, I only knew two of the players in this: George and Linda. I actually won George at the time. Um, I had met one of the other guys that was on the team, and they, in a sense, they formed the team because they were concerned about what I and George were writing, and Linda as well. But like I say, Linda came on later. Uh, uh, so they they actually formed it. But if the need arises now, <laughs> you know, I, I sound a little hypocritical. I didn't know three of the guys. And I committed to them, but I trusted the people that brought them in. Uh, that was then. Now, with the government uh, so actively pursuing in investing themselves into uh, anything uh, patriotic, uh, it's even more riskier. So the committee, uh, a security team should be composed of people that you've known for many years, that you've known has never been charged with a crime and uh, – been alleviated of any responsibility for the crime via plea agreement or uh, discharge of the crime. When I say crime, I don't mean traffic tickets, but something that might have gotten jail or prison time. Uh, mm -hmm. Stay away from those people. I wrote informants amongst us, for example, to show what a, uh, a plea agreement might entail based upon a plea agreement that was offered but not accepted by a friend of mine. Uh, but it's got to be people you've known for a long time. If you just moved into the community, for example, Kyle. Uh, Kyle, I don't know how he, he uh, how many friends he has down there, but he's fairly new and, and knows just about nobody down where he lives. He could never form a community uh, uh, security team unless he met somebody that he felt uh, they felt comfortable and he trusted the other guy. Uh, mm -hmm. But in a community, you know, if you've been where you are for most of your life, then you know who you can trust. So uh, depending on your circumstances, just judge carefully who you might uh, join in pre uh, creating a, a security team. Sit down. If anybody has any misgivings about what you're creating the first meeting, exclude them from future meetings. Okay. Uh, okay. Be very cautious. Yeah, and you, you definitely made a you definitely made a good point there. And uh, obviously, when, when you look at the political prisoners archive, uh, I, I'm not going to say all of them, but probably most of them. Um, there were there was there was uh, whether it was issues with vetting or whether it was just the fact that uh, the government's so adamant about infiltrating groups now. Uh, whatever the case may be, it, it'll be. Uh, um, I, I agree with you. It needs to be people that you've known your entire life, and all of the other all of the other stipulations that you laid out. Because uh, yeah, it can be uh, it can be hard to uh, find trustworthy people now, um, especially with uh, all of the infiltration into into some of these uh, these groups and organizations and, and militias and things of that nature. Yeah, the okay. uh, yeah, and and the easiest one to to get to is uh, we don't know if it happened with Barbo, uh, but we suspect it happened with Forrester, and we don't know who it was with Beecher. Uh, and we don't really know the background of the one involved in Wolf, uh, but getting an informant uh, is easy if they can charge him with child molestation. We'll drop the charges if you sign this plea agreement, but you go back to prison if you 
don't produce. And that, like I say, is explained yep. in Informus Amongst Us, uh, that, uh, there, and, and we can go back to the 90s. The, uh, I had some friends in what was called the uh, uh, Viper Militia in Phoenix, and I knew some of the people in the West Virginia Militia, and both of them had informants get involved, then bring other people in, and the consequence was uh, they got busted and ended up spending time in prison. So yeah. <laughs> even 20 years ago, you had to be extremely care careful. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so we are actually up to the uh, to the end of the show here, and we might actually get get done on time, which would be which would be fantastic. We gotta get gotta get better at that. Uh, so uh, so Gary, uh, any uh, closing thoughts that you'd like to leave listeners with regarding committees of safety uh, or security teams? Well, uh, only with a committee of safety. I think we've discussed security teams sufficiently. But uh, remember, the United States of America, the country and the Constitution would not have existed if it wasn't for committees of safety. And we need to revisit our history and understand the significance of that. And it's explained in pretty extensive detail if you spend some time at committee.org look at some of the historical documents, download the zip file, uh, and look at the various uh, documents that have been prepared over 20 years with regard to the subject. It, we are the United States. We are unique in the world uh, in terms of the people actually forming the government. And uh, that uniqueness uh, includes committees of safety uh, that, that brought us to where we are in that point in history. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming on, Gary. And I will put the the links to uh, committee.org and also um, just the uh, the uh, um, Harney County Committee of Safety as well, just for the uh, benefit of the listeners. Uh, but Gary, thank you so much for coming on. It was uh, very, very informative. And uh, you have a uh, great rest of your evening, sir. Hey guys, so after I finished re-listening to uh, this episode in its entirety, uh, I figured I'd pop back in here for a couple of conclusionary notes. Uh, now, obviously, committees of safety, security teams, and militias are mit mitigative strategies, uh, meaning I see them as ways to organize people locally who wouldn't be receptive to other methods of direct action uh, slash volume lifestyle changes. And committees of safety are formed with the individual explicit consent of the members, so who are we to judge? Uh, if there's not a violation of consent, there's no coercion. And of course, these are time-tested and historically proven uh, in, their in their efficacy. Finally, in terms of invulnerability to coercion, uh, there are both pros and cons. Uh, due to the above-board, transparent nature of committees of safety, uh, they might reduce one's privacy, and also, I suppose, uh, since they are in some ways challenging the existing local, local governments, uh, there could be some tension. Uh, I don't know, guys. Maybe uh, local committees of safety uh, are the answer to UN Agenda 2030. Hmm. I don't know. Something to consider, at least. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay with me.